All right, here we go. So there's some key links there. Um, in the next page here, you'll see there's some information about regulations, um, which I'm going to update this slide here so that you see those next time. But uh, licensure standards, all kinds of good stuff there. The Denver ALR also has a Facebook page. I pulled this image today. We have 304 members. If you're not a member, go ahead and join. We do post a lot of things there that are helpful hints. Um, uh, if we, we get information from Pankowski Law, then we'll post it there. So this is a good place to kind of stay tuned. If you, you know, the way Facebook algorithms work, if you engage, you'll see those things come up in your feed. If you don't, if you don't like, comment, share, any of that, it's not going to show up in your feed. So you won't even see that unless you come to our page, which most people aren't thinking of that. So of course, the meetup. Um, by show of hands, how many of you came through the meetup? Or versus through our mailing list? Meetup, a couple of you. OK, so when you do that, if you go through meetup and you um, if you say join or I can't remember attend, I think is what it is, and you join that meetup list, it'll send you notifications when a new event has been posted or special event or something like that. And it does help because if we if people see that a lot of people are attending, they're like, mm, this is valuable. If you only if there's only like six people say they're attending, then people just look and go, eh, this probably isn't worth it. So. I would encourage you to join Meetup. There's lots of good stuff on Meetup, but definitely do, uh, do sign up there if you can. Okay, so now I'll go ahead and go Facebook Live here. Now this is my first time doing this too, so <laughs> let's see how well I go. All right, continue. Live streaming. Oh boy, this should be fun. To a page. Oh gosh, to a group. It would be helpful if I send it to the right group. Okay, go live. <clears throat> being live streamed. Here we go. All right. So we're going to talk about these sponsors here. All right. So RAL National Association. Um, how many of you are members of the RAL National Association by show of hands? Good, good, good. If you're not, I would encourage you to do this. It is a free membership and there's all kinds of great things that come with that. So please do check it out. Uh, of course, this is our page. They, we have a link here on the Denver ALR page, right to RAL, and that gives you all kinds of great information there as well. Uh, we will be posting a code. So if you're going to attend RAL NatCon, around the association's uh, convention in September in Phoenix, you can pick up your tickets from that, uh, from that site. So we'll have that probably in the next couple of days. Of course, we've got Anderson Legal and Tax Advisors. I don't know, do we have anyone here from Anderson today? Nope, okay. And we've got Assisted Living Marketing. Peter, do you wanna say something? Sure, I'm always ready to say something. <laughs> I don't know if it's helpful, but I'll say something. Okay. Uh, hey, everybody, uh, Peter Brissett, assistantlibbymarketing.com. We do the digital marketing for senior care. That's our primary focus. Been doing that for more than 12 years. Um, we're super affordable. Um, people tell me I should charge more, but whatever. Um, Everybody's raising prices, so I don't know. We're getting by. Um, but yeah, if you need help or have questions, um, let us know. We'd be glad to help. 
And I do want to give Peter a shout out. I was the one that was in charge of our new website, which is grandavenuebrokers.com. Uh, so kind of our umbrella site. And I was the one working with Peter directly. And it has been super easy to work with him. He doesn't give you a bunch of guff about not knowing everything. He just walks you through the process, super responsive, and he's just been fantastic. And the output was fantastic as well. So if you haven't checked out our, our new website, please do. It's a screaming testament to how awesome he does. So thanks, Peter. All right, so we've got Pinkowski Law, Brian and Michelle. Are you, I didn't see them come in. Did, did anybody else see them pop in? Are you here, Brian or Michelle? Nope, doesn't look like it. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I would do, I would point out here at the bottom, there is a link to their blog. I'm going to post in the chat all of the sponsors links, our website, our contact information, all of that in there. So I'll walk you through how to download that chat towards the end of the meeting, but you'll have all of this right there in your chat that you can save and come back to. Okay, so route lease options, we talked a little bit about this. On our website, you can get there a couple ways. You can just go to routeleaseoptions.com or if you're on our dollar website, it's in the get funding tab. It'll take you to the same thing. There is a new video there that, that explains how the whole lease option works. So if you're thinking about buying, expanding, uh, you have an operator, an administrator who's wanting to buy one as well, but they're not sure they can, they can finance it, definitely send them there. We can help them. Ooh, now I didn't update this because Vern is sick and I was trying not to, you know, bog him down with brain work today, but uh, we did just launch this website and we're collecting email addresses so that we can send you inventory as soon as we see it. Now, these are things that could be local. They could be across the country. Um, it, some of the, if it's not our listing, it'll be some kind of generic. It'll be like beds, baths, you know, their specialty um, and the location and price if it's available. But if you scan this little QR code, and for those of you who are new to the scanning, um, all you have to do is just turn on your camera and just point it at the screen and then a website will come up and you just click that little link and it'll give you the screen where you can plug in your information and select the things that you want at the bottom of that list is send listings to my inbox. So there's a little option for you there. So I'll leave that up for just a second here. And if I take it down too quick, just take yourself off a of mute and say, hold on a second. <laughs> All right, do we have any news from Cala? I can do that. My name is awesome. Janet Cornell. I'm on the board of Cala. Um, we're doing some exciting education. Peter, who's also on the board, has put together our education program for the next six months. We got some great stuff going on. Fall one day conference, um, the end of September. Um, we're doing some happy hours so you can network with people in the business and rub shoulders and say, hey, how's it going for you? So we got some good stuff going on at Cala, and I would encourage you guys to join. Thank you, Janet. Mm -hmm. uh, Janet, if you wouldn't mind sending me some, some links, I'll put that in the newsletter and get those posted as well. Okay, I'll put that in the chat. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so next up, I don't know, I feel like I'm zooming through this super fast. I am, we're ahead of the game. <laughs> so hopefully I'm not missing anything. So we're gonna move on to our presentation by Bridget, and I'm gonna let her pronounce her last name for you because I know I'm gonna goof it up, but she's gonna be talking about the late, the looming labor crisis. And Bridget, are you are you able to hear us and speak with us? Yep, I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, awesome. Okay. I'm gonna share screen, I'm gonna turn off my screen share and I'm gonna give you control here. All right. Sharing. And then um, while you're doing that, so my last name is K Slack. Um, simpler than it looks, but people definitely do struggle with it. So I always just say long A, two syllables. Awesome. Um, Thank you. 
So I should be able to share. I believe so. <clears throat> and I don't know if there's something on my end I need to do. Oh, there we go. No, but can you tell me, are you seeing um, the, the presentation view or like the slide view? I am now seeing the presentation view. <clears throat> okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much for um, for having care on. Hopefully, make a, a good investment of your time with us today. So I'm actually in Pittsburgh. So it is nine oh, after nine. It's nine thirty where I am, which I am an old fuddy duddy. So it is after my bedtime. So bear with me. <laughs> um, but real quick, just to give you guys um, quick kind of overview of CARE. So again, Bridget Kaslack, uh, co-founder and uh, COO of CARE. Um, my business partner, Charles Turner and I, we founded CARE um, in 2019. So just before COVID hit us, but Charles is actually an owner operator himself. He had quite a few buildings in the Sun Belt um, throughout Texas, Alabama, Georgia, Florida. Um, and he knew firsthand uh, the staffing challenges and, and what the hurdles were to overcoming them. So I myself was working in another um, arm of the industry, still with technology, still in our space, but I was selling resident engagement technology. Um, resident engagement at the time was very near and dear to my heart, but as I spent more time in the space, I just saw the the labor challenge, what it was doing, not only for you guys as operators, being able to provide care for your seniors, doing so in an affordable way, but really for that frontline worker, um, what their experience was like, um, you know, just living day to day with the job that they were very passionate about doing. Um, so Charles really kind of had this idea to provide a better solution. We are a staffing solution, but we're very much not a staffing agency. Staffing agencies, um, you know, three main problems with them, um, you know, they, you never really know who's coming to work in your building. They just send you somebody that you don't really know. Um, you usually have a, a long contract, an expensive contract with them. Their rates are outrageous, which we've unfortunately seen only get higher. Um, and then if you do meet somebody that you like, it's not a great referral tool as they have really hefty contract buyouts if you want to bring this person into work. So CARE has sort of undone all of that. We are a digital labor marketplace. We are not a staffing agency. Um, you guys set the rates, operators, providers, building owners do not have any contracts with us. We don't bind you to anything. Um, very quick, 15 minutes to set up an account. You post shifts, everything's on a per shift basis. Um, you post shifts for free. And then that opens up to our pool of pre-vetted, pre-qualified. We have CNAs, QMAPs, LPNs, RNs. Um, we do all the heavy lifting up front in terms of vetting them, making sure they're qualified to work in your building. Your shifts show up on the app they have, almost similar to like an Uber concept where Ubers can kind of just decide when and where they want to drive. We have a very similar platform. So with that, um, and I, I think I mentioned to you, there's no contract, but you guys also set your pay rates. We don't set any pay rates. So we always say, you pay our heroes. We call the labor on our platform a hero. You pay our heroes essentially what you would pay your own staff anyway. We want you to be about financially indifferent from using um, the folks you find with us. And if you do like them, if you work with somebody um, for a couple of shifts, if you like them, you can hire them. And we don't have any contract buyouts for that either. So you basically can hire our folks for free. So CARE can be a great recruiting tool for you as well. Um, so I set the stage on all of that um, to help you understand what I'm getting into. You can see here we have access to tens of thousands of frontline workers. Something CARE is very missional and passionate about is really understanding um, those frontline workers. And with our pool of folks, we can survey them, and we often do. The survey I'm going to show you now um, and go through some of that, we really wanted to understand when COVID hit, we were seeing um, a lot of studies about what their fears were, what was keeping them from working, but it was all interviews and really from a lot of perspectives of providers. Um, and we thought, what about, let's, let's ask the worker themselves, let's really understand their voice. And that's something CARE wants to do um, frequently about all sorts of things, is just have a really good collective voice of that frontline worker. So I'm gonna go through really some interesting um, 
questions we asked, some interesting studies on that. So really, this is the mindset of that senior living workforce. When we talk about a senior living workforce, mostly going to be talking about CNAs, um, but in the before times, the before times, of course, now is unfortunately before COVID. Before COVID, the National Institute of Mental Health already estimated that low-wage earners, this is just across all industries, low-wage earners, but now especially frontline healthcare workers, are two to five times more likely to suffer from a diagnosable mental disorder. Now, those are not necessarily like major, major mental disorders, but things like um, personality disorder, borderline disorder, just these things that are very functional, but you handle stress differently. Um, and there is more stress in your life when you are a low, low wage earner, just living paycheck to paycheck. The job itself is very stressful, working off hours, things like that. Um, so already two to five times more likely suffering from those. And then you think we put this person um, on the front lines of a global pandemic. So they are in a very high risk situation. So you can only imagine what that already does. So now we see essential workers during the pandemic um, diagnosed at even higher rates um, and then just suffering through a little more with the day-to-day -day challenges. So what we wanted to do with CARE is just really get in front of them, understand them and learn more about that. This is not all about COVID. Luck uh, luckily, we're on what I think is coming out of it, what I hope is the back end. Um, so we're really going to talk about things in general, but just to give you some understanding of the survey, we did survey over 1,200 care heroes and community users. So the cool thing about this is we asked community users, I say users, folks on our platform um, that are the owner operators, admin, scheduling coordinators in the buildings, and then our heroes. We asked them the same track of questions. So the heroes, what do you think? And then the community users, what do you think your frontline workers think? We wanted to see how aligned those two thoughts were. Of our survey, of our heroes that responded, just want to point out 79% of them were CNAs or CMAs uh, for Denver, for you guys, QMAP. Um, that's just particular to point out because, again, that is kind of more in the lower wage. So I want to point that out. And then over 50% have been working in senior care um, for more than 10 years. So these are folks that have really been with us well before COVID. Um, so they've seen the industry in a little bit more of a normal state. So the first question we asked is the threat of COVID has made me consider leaving senior care forever. So this is when the staffing challenges really was getting highlighted and at a peak all time high and we were trying to figure out how to navigate it. The threat of COVID has made me consider leaving senior care forever. 80% of the heroes that we surveyed disagreed with this. The threat of COVID, they were not threatened by going into work and facing this pandemic. So that was awesome news. Um, but when we asked our communities the same question, I believe that caregivers and nurses are leaving due to the threat of COVID. They believe that they are, but we just saw that the heroes are not. So this was something interesting to us, kind of just to figure out, okay, if they're not, but we believe they are, then maybe we're taking some missteps. Maybe we're not navigating this the best we could. So let's, okay, maybe if it's not COVID, vaccine mandates have made me consider leaving senior care forever. We know when we had our folks get um, their vaccines, we thought maybe people wouldn't do that. 80%, again, 80% of heroes disagreed. They were um, you know, willing to keep their jobs, face COVID and get vaccinated. But when we asked the communities, that they, if they believe that caregivers and nurses is or are is your staff leaving due to vaccine mandates, 80% of communities believe they were when a strong majority of our caregivers and nurses said they were not. Um, just to give a little bit more data to support that, we did ask our heroes, and we actually tracked this because we have to know their vaccination status to be able to send them into buildings to work. But 90% were at least partially vaccinated. So that supported the fact that they were not afraid to get vaccinated. You see the strong majority double vaccinated and double vax boosted um, with a little bit there, some ex ex um, exemptions and things like that. So, so far, they're not really afraid of COVID. They're not worrying about getting vaccinated. Uh, we did ask some questions like PPE. That was not an issue. So now, okay, if it's not that, if people aren't working in our buildings for COVID-related reasons, what's next? Of course, the biggest thing we could think about is money. I believe the community that I work in has made fair and satisfactory efforts to increase compensation relative 
to the value of work we're doing right now. And we know nobody was kind of valued more than those frontline workers at the height of COVID. So to ask them, do you think you're paid fairly and satisfactory? Most people, I, I've done this presentation before in person and asked for a um, raise of hands, but this was actually kind of shocking to me, 60% agree. I think if you ask most people in any industry, in any climate, if they believe they're paid in a fair and satisfactory manner, they would disagree. But here, our folks are saying, our heroes are saying they agree that they're being paid fair and satisfactory compared to their efforts in the in the COVID times. So now we ask the communities, or we didn't actually ask the communities that. What we wanted to do is find out, okay, if it's not COVID, if it's not vaccines, if it's not money, what are the things that are making these folks leave the industry or at least leave your building? What's motivating them to, to work? And we actually, from a previous survey we did, and you guys can find some white papers on all of this, get deeper into this data on our website, which is doyoucare.com, care with a K. Um, we've got these white papers listed. But from a previous survey, we know that the biggest reason people leave their jobs is they feel disrespected. So we wanted to learn a little bit more about that because we, we can understand that, but if we don't know what that means to them or where it's coming from, of course, it's hard to manage. So we asked, when you feel disrespected, who is that person? What is, where do you feel that disrespect is coming from? This answer was also interesting to me because I would have thought it was the shift supervisor or the scheduling coordinator, somebody they have more day-to-day -day interaction with but you can see that the admin or the ED was actually highest on that list. So that just really shows the value of the, the leadership at that building and the example they're setting um, and how they need to lead with example and understand what respect looks like to this class of frontline workers. Um, the next thing we wanted to understand about this is we know who is disrespectful, but now what is disrespectful? So when you feel disrespected, do you feel, what do you feel is the biggest display or area of disrespect? This one was also interesting to me. We'll talk about the two at the top. Of course, not listening to my needs and ideas. Everybody wants to feel listened to. Um, improper staffing, that's one of those things that I have to highlight that just because that problem perpetuates itself. Um, it's hard to get staff if you don't have enough staffing because then the staff you do get in feels overworked because they're understaffed. So, that is just the importance of finding the staffing solutions you need to help supplement and keep the staff you have. Um, but not listening to my needs or ideas was, a, was the top one that we wanna look at. The interesting one to me too was the bottom one, because we think that, and I, I've talked to a lot of community leaders, a lot of culture leaders, culture is a big word, um, that believe that praise and feedback is a big thing. And it ranked at the very bottom of this. So we're understanding that these, these folks, they really don't want the, the praise for the job they're doing. They just want to be listened to. So I did just want to point out that answer there because what's funny about that, and, and I say funny, I don't really mean funny, but when COVID hit, you talk about praise and feedback, what did we all do? And, and we all did it. We saw it on commercials. We saw it in the front lines of our building. We praised them. We praised them so much. And, and yes, that there's, you know, we all did it, and I'm sure it made some people feel good, but it wasn't really, they wanted to be listened to. They didn't want to be celebrated and called heroes, but we all did it. Um, so point out that um, we wanted to look at the longevity to see how committed to our space are the people that we're working with. Five years from now, I'll still be working in senior care. Strong majority agrees with that, so that's awesome. So now it's our job to take that 75 and do what we need to do, listen to them, keep them, understand them. Um, so how do we improve that mindset? What can we do? And this is a, a real quick demonstration or um, presentation for you guys, but how do we improve that mindset? How can we keep the 75% that we have? So the first is understand them. If we, if we don't know what drives them, what motivates them, what demotivates them, what we need, we just truly can't manage them. So we have to understand them. That's where CARE, again, we're really excited to have the volume of people we do on our platform because we constantly want to do surveys like this and deliver this information to our industry, to folks like and groups like you guys. 
And exactly that, survey them, listen to them. If you can't do it um, at your own buildings, then find sources like this that can get them help. That goes back to that short staffing. Um, in doing what I do, I talk to a lot of organizations that are kind of staunchly against bringing in outside staff. And while we understand that continuity of care is extremely important, we understand that, but kind of at what cost? And if you can find the right partner in something like CARE where you can bring people in and hire them so they become part of your staff, they're more aligned with you because they're not um, loyal to a staffing agency, you kind of have those temporary pains for a long-term win of building up your own full-time staff. But in the meantime, find the ways, and I, I know this is a pain point for you guys all the time, but how can you not run short staff to respect the people that are coming there to work, not overwork them? Respect is a huge part of this. I don't really need to go too much more into that. But good pay, affordable benefits, absolutely. I'm gonna say affordable benefits, but I do wanna make one quick note on benefits as well, just something to think about. Um, a lot of providers in the space do offer benefits. So the typical benefits, you know, healthcare, dental, vision, 401k, those things absolutely can be offered, but also think outside the box. For a lot of these low wage earners, those benefits are sort of luxuries that they can't necessarily afford. So when you're thinking about benefits, maybe survey your team, things like grocery stipends, childcare, um, gas stipends, things, things that help them do the day to day. We've actually surveyed a lot of our heroes on other topics as well. And, and there's, there is a general um, lifestyle that they admit to, which is they work to put gas in their car and they put gas in their car to get to work. So those are the things that they need as benefits to support their day to day. Um, redefine your culture. Uh, we all work to have really great cultures, uh, but let's really think about what culture is. Is it, um, you know, pizza parties, ping pong tables and break rooms, things like that, or is it really understanding that frontline worker and the culture they want, which is being understood, respected, and listened to? The last thing I'm going to leave you on is do not allow your CNAs to be treated like commodities. So the point of a commodity is to be sold to the highest bidder. And that's where we want everything above. They won't leave you to go down the street for a quarter an hour more. And to illustrate that really quickly, what, what do you mean treat them like commodities? So on our platform, and these are actual screenshots of our app. On our platform, when somebody posts the shift, again, everything is per shift basis, the system asks them to write a shift description. I always talk about to our community the importance of this shift description. This is an actual shift posting. The shift description says ADLs. So if you're a CNA, you very much know that your job as a CNA is to assist residents with their activities of daily living. So that to me is almost disrespectful. It's at the very least not appealing where you have another community, and it might be hard for you guys to read this just depending on the screen you're on, so I'll read it out loud, but we are looking for an experienced, hardworking CNA with good customer service skills who will take care of our residents. You let them know what you expect from them. Knowledge of point-click care, complete 100% documentation. When you accept a shift, you are a member of the Windermere Estates team. That to me, it sounds so silly, but that is respect. You are respecting the job they do. You're respecting what you're asking them to come in and do to help you care for your residents, where over here is just sort of not that appealing. Um, so that's really it. I know that's a quick thing, but just wanted to kind of share with you guys what we are looking at, what we're thinking about, again, when we're working with all of the frontline folks that we have, we wanna be very, very missional. If we take care of them, and we as in the collective, we all of us not just care, if we can understand and take care of them, then they will be there, they will show up, we will be able to attract more folks to the space, at the very least attract more people to our buildings. So that is it, I know that was quick. So Renee, I hope I didn't, uh, I hope you didn't want me to take up too much more time, but. That is it from me. You guys can see there my um, my name and email address. If you have any questions, if you want to know anything else about our data, feel free to reach out. If you want to know anything else about care, feel free to reach out. Honestly, if you have any ideas on things you would like to see in a survey, feel free to reach out with that as well. We're happy to kind of bring in some new ideas on what we can understand about our frontline workers.
I think I saw a couple of questions in the chat. Janet, was it you that you asked a couple questions? Myself. Yeah, in Colorado, most of our counties are high in transmission. So before we can take a caregiver on staff, they need to be they need to be either up to date, which means they have COVID vaccines plus boosters, depending on where they are in the, you know, if, if they need to be up to date according to Colorado standards. So if they're not up to date, we are required to test them before shift, before them taking a shift and twice weekly with PCR tests. Do you guys do that for your staff? Yeah, so we do, I, I think there was a couple things in there, so I'll try to address it all. If I don't, please flag me. Um, we, we, every state we're in, we do look at the state um, regulations, what's required. So at the bare minimum, most states are um, BLS certificate, TB test, medical exam, background check, drug screen. We do all of that. Certain states have a few more nuances um, with Colorado specifically, we absolutely do the, the CAPS check for them. Um, and then for the COVID testing and vaccine, we do not require it. Okay. However, if they're vaccinated, they can upload that vaccine card and we can flag that their um, profile that they are vaccinated. Um, and then they just, if, they're, if a community that they are working in requires testing, we just say, let them know when they come in that they'll have to get tested. The cool thing is though, is on our platform, um, you have full visibility to all of that. So unlike an agency where you just call and we send you somebody, you yeah. log in and Hero applies to work a shift, you see all of their documentation, their vaccine card, anything like that. So that's great, but um, what, if, what if your staff get to my building and I do a rapid test and they test positive, so then I have to send them home? Because we have to rapid test. If they're, it, it, in Colorado, it's, it's vaccinated plus boosted. So right. if you send me somebody that's vaccinated but not boosted, I have to rapid test them before they can take the shift. Yeah, so um, you can only pick, you can, when you post a shift, you can say, I only will accept people that are double vaxxed or vaxxed and boosted. So you can filter out your heroes through that way. Okay, but so anybody, in Colorado, you'd probably have to say vaccinated plus boosted yeah. to, to make that yeah. compliant because they have to be vaccinated plus boosted here to, to comply with with regulation, yeah, okay. And if, if they're 50 years old and older, then they have to be vaccinated, boosted twice. Yeah, that's the regulation here in town. Okay, okay, now I get it, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have and, a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Great, so I'm JR, I'm out in the Bay Area and we're looking to start opening up facilities, but you know, our big question is labor really tough from what I can tell from all the research I've done. And um, so we're kind of in the app world haven here. Um, and so the key to those things are, you know, are the caregivers actually gonna use the app? In other words, if I download your app today, can I count on it to be a major provider of labor for multiple facilities that I build throughout the Southwest? That would be my question. Yeah, that's a great question and that is, my sort of like passion project as we build the team and build our market. So care, the way we grow, we grow by, by market. Um, so we, when we get into a state, we figure out all the state regulations, we program our product to do a workflow according to what's required. But then from there, we look at a state and it, it is a very difficult um, and delicate balance. So I'll kind of be, try to be quick about this. Um, we'll look and say, okay, we wanna go into Denver. I actually built Denver up as a market myself. We wanna go into Denver. The first thing we do is we start recruiting heroes. We recruit heroes in very traditional ways. We post our positions on LinkedIn, or I'm sorry, on Indeed. Um, we let them know what the position is like, flexible, app-based, not guaranteed hours, not benefits, things like that. Um, so we post the positions and then we figure out kind of based on the geography of the market, how many heroes do we need to start posting some shifts? So we will say, okay, we've got 30 heroes onboarded and ready to work. Let's bring on one or two buildings that can start posting shifts so that the, the supply and demand has to support each other. And then sure. we just kind of let that work for about 
30, 45, 60 days. Then those heroes start working. Our team has been recruiting more heroes in the background. So now our 30 heroes turns to 60. <laughs> so we could say, okay, we can now allow more buildings in. Oh, I can't hear um, you. Oh, sorry. Are you the only one that can't hear? I can hear you. That's me. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, we, we're very intentional for that reason. We don't want, um, you know, people to count on us and heroes not there to work. We don't certainly also don't want to bring in heroes and have no shifts for them to work. So we just go kind of little bits at a time. And it takes some time when we're in a new market. We say the market really won't be established for about 60 days. And then it just kind of grows wildfire from there. I always look at the Uber analogy. You know, I, I live in Pittsburgh. My friends got Uber about a year before I did in Washington, D.C. They told me about it. I said, that sounds like the craziest thing in the world. You mean a stranger comes and picks you up in his personal car? They said, yes. I remember Uber came to Pittsburgh. I was very hesitant. I didn't do it for about five or six months. You know, Uber worked to find drivers, but they had no control over the people on the streets that would actually be passengers. But then it just becomes the norm. Yeah, sure. You have your early adopters for sure. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, for me, I'm really concerned about finding labor out here. You know. Um, yeah. So, are you in the market yet? In the Bay Area market yet? You know, we're not. So California is, is tricky. I'm assuming you're speaking of California. I just want to double check because I know this is a Denver thing. Um, California, California Bay Area. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of red tape that we have to navigate through, not only as a um, contract position, but then also different training requirements for AL versus training require, you know, on-site training, things like that. So we're not in California yet, but we are working on it. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the other I, thing real quick. I have a question. Oh, sure. Um, I'm sorry. Do you cover the Florida market yet? We do. Yep. We're, we're really well into Florida. Most markets up both coastlines and throughout the center, Orlando, things like that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, JR, one thing I did want to mention too, and this might help everybody on the call, but as I mentioned earlier with my partner being an owner operator, he knew um, what things like contracts, monthly subscription fees, what all of those did to not only your property values, but your, you know, balance sheets, all of that. So we don't have any of that. No contracts, no cost to have the system, no cost to post a shift. That is also because we know it takes time to build up a market. So even when we would start in the Bay Area, we would, you know, we work with our partners, they keep posting shifts, let our heroes know opportunity is there, even if they're not ready to work yet but there's not a ton of risk to you guys on it. Granted, you need staff, I get it, but it's not like you're paying for the system if you're not getting heroes in the building. Yeah, the, the risk is uh, certainly if we uh, need labor, which, which we desperately do. <laughs> right. and, we, and, and, you know, first of all, I think your app is the way to do it. The problem is traction to get both sides of the marketplace feeding each other you know, without a billion dollars invested. Um, right. So, yeah, so I'm just, um, you know, that's my concern. I mean, I would love to just be able to go on the app and fill a facility, you know, very, I mean, it just makes sense, right? But, it, but you know, it's going to take, uh, you know, take a while, it sounds like. And, and it, it, I, yeah, it takes some time and balance. And I've, I've gotten off the calls, you know, set up calls with some communities and they're so thrilled and so excited. And they're like, I can't wait to tear up my staffing agency contract and never use those guys or pay them another penny again. I actually say like, hold off, <laughs> don't do yeah. that yet because they are gonna provide you some staff until we can be a little bit more stable at your community and in your market. But from there, I mean, we started in Denver probably December of 2019. Denver's one of our strongest markets now. We've got thousands and thousands of ships filled a day and thousands of heroes working wow. and wanting so. Wow. Yeah, for yeah. us, uh, for us, I don't really care about paying the marketing fee. It's just a customer acquisition cost, and as long as you can plug that number into your spreadsheet and you know you can rely on it, that's cool. My problem is, you know, I so far I haven't found anything I can rely on here for labor. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. a huge problem, and I'm sure you're aware of it, but it's it's a huge problem here. 
I am, and I want to get to California very quickly. So as soon as we can navigate some of the laws and regulations, we will start working on it to hopefully solve, because there's a lot of demand for California. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bridget, this is Janet Cornell, and I'm with CATLA. We're working with legislators here in Colorado. Um, our state health department is not in favor of this app, unfortunately, because there's not enough training for the people that you're providing. But we're trying to do a workaround on that um, and work directly with the care team. Because right now in Colorado, your training is not transportable from one facility to the next. So if you guys train them at your facility, we have to train them once they come on site with us. So I, I think this is brilliant. It's much needed. So we're a supporter of you guys. We just have to figure out how to mesh that with our state health department and how to get them to accept this, um, this, you know, this way of providing labor because it's actually yeah. not safe to have enough care providers in the building. You're safer to have enough care providers that maybe aren't you know 100 trained a lot of these a lot of these care providers have been trained over and over and over at other facilities but the state health department in colorado is not recognizing because we didn't train them in our building so we are very much in support of care i think this is a tremendous opportunity to um provide much needed care in facilities that that you know I, I was there, I would, I would bid on shifts, you know, with even our home care providers. I would say, okay, tell somebody we'll pay them $40 an hour. We need it tonight between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. We're short, somebody called in sick, it's, you know, 7 p.m. So we already tried to do these, this exact concept and the home health care agencies are not set up to do that. So this is an awesome opportunity. We just need to one up our criteria here in Colorado to make sure that you guys are compliant with, with what we need to, to meet regulation. Yeah, no, and I, I appreciate all of that support so much. Thank you, it's amazing to hear. Um, and that is something, I mean, it, it's a new model. It is, it's a mm -hmm. new model where a lot of states, a lot of state associations, a lot of state leaders to kind of carve out space for our model and not space, but carve out understanding because you're absolutely right is, is the risk. Yeah being short staffed. And so it's just, yeah. it's, and a lot of states are kind of breaking through. A lot of states are understanding mm -hmm. that regulations are written in a time that was before a solution like we had to offer. So. Exactly, exactly. So this is so awesome for us here in Denver and in Colorado. We are excited to welcome you guys and get on board with you um, and try to work as a care partner with you, not you know to use your cliche, but we need to be able to support you guys to address our labor shortage here in Denver, because we are probably equally as bad as California. And this is such a great opportunity for nursing students that have clinicals and they can't dictate a schedule. They can get on your app anytime, you know, and pick up a shift because they can't dictate because they have clinicals at any given time. CNA students have clinicals. I mean, it's such a wonderful working model for all of us here. We just have to work together with you guys to make sure that their training that they get from you guys is transportable to the facility because right now in Colorado, they're mandating that the facility has to train that individual. And that's so upside down. You know, if, if somebody has 12 years of dementia training and, and, and work history, they should not have to take a six hour course on dementia care. They've been, they could teach the course at that point, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So one thing to mention, it doesn't, it doesn't fully address this, but we do only allow licensed professionals on our app. So we have mm -hmm. people, they'll send us our resume and they'll say, hey, I've been a caregiver at you know XYZ community for 20 years. If they don't have a license, we unfortunately do not allow them on the platform because that license is what is our validation that they have been trained, they've been certified, and then they need to renew that license every year, um, which we look at. So that helps with that part. It's like we know they we we can prove they have the basic CNA training. And you're right. If if they're seeing if the state can give them a license that says they're certified to do this job, the building in that state should trust that they're certified to do that job. Okay. Okay. So you can only send CNAs. You can't just send QMAPs in Colorado. We 
So they have to have that Q map. Yeah, designation. Yeah, okay. the Q map designation, okay. and then our system, our system knows when somebody posts a shift that it requires a Q map and matches them with the requirements that is tied to the hero's profile that they have that Q map certification. Okay, and what if I need somebody that's CPR and first aid certified? You have that on their file before I request the caregiver. Okay. Yeah, that's a requirement for all of our heroes, but you can see it directly on their profile to know for sure that they have it, but they are not oh, allowed awesome. on our platform. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. So can I ask a question? Forgive me because yeah. I'm, you know, not in the field. Janet, when you say their training, are you saying like, um, let's say they've been at XYZ assisted living facility and then they come work at ABC facility, you're saying that the state says, well, you can't work here because you've not been trained here, even though you have all this, all these licenses? Well, there's some specifics in Colorado that if you take a shift, you gotta be, you gotta be trained on the policies and procedures and the fire exit plan for that facility. So, so if you're at XYZ, their, their policies and procedures are different and their fire exit is different than ABC. So there's the hang up. Um, the other hang up in Colorado is if you're working the shift alone, like a group home, you 100% have to be trained on the fire exit and the policies and procedures. But if you're not there alone, then, then they give you some wiggle room. So if you're in a bigger facility or if you have somebody else on staff in Colorado, you can go ahead and work in the facility and not be trained on fire code or fire exit for that facility. But if you're alone, like a group home, that's a little bit dicey. No. So if you, if I, I have a training and development background. So the first thing that comes to mind is, okay, so, you know, when I, when I was doing policies and procedures, that could be, you know, this big, could it be something that is bullet pointed video, something that could be done quickly, or does it have to be like, you have to have six hours of training and you have to have 12 hours of training of this. Can it be something like, Yes, I have. I have read these things. I've been trained on this. It's it's specific to the facility that you're at because everybody I, has their own policies and procedures. Like I only allowed an eight foot oxygen cord because I had a group home and you couldn't have a 40 foot oxygen cord. You couldn't let the lady out of her bedroom and go to the dining room because other people would trip over her oxygen cord. But if she's in her own apartment, well, yeah, have at it. Do a 40 foot oxygen cord. That's how specific the regs are in Colorado. So, so we, in my, sorry, my facilities, I had to train people that we only allow an eight foot, foot oxygen cord. We can't do from the bedroom to the dining room because we have six other people that are going to come to the dining room and trip over her cord. So that was the mm -hmm. difference. We are working hard from Cala to get some of that changed. We need portability with training. We do because we are gonna die on the vine here for labor if we can't do portability with training. If somebody has you know, dementia training with your building that you have 18 people with dementia, that should be transferable to my building that has 12 people with dementia. But right now in Colorado, we don't have portability with training. Janet, one thing that CARE does that may, you sound familiar with what we do, and I love that. This may address some of it, and, and Renee, it certainly talks to what you're kind of proposing here. On our platform, when we set up a building, they're required to upload what the state requires for orientation. In most oh. states, that is infection control policy, resident bill of rights, abuse and neglect policy, emergency evacuation procedures, and when to notify your admin. Um, those documents are uploaded and our system actually has blockers in it that when a, when a hero, our system knows, you know, Carrie caregiver is going to work at this building for the first time. She's never worked in that building. Our app presents her with the documents that the community has uploaded. She has to read them and then she has to say that she has read them. She has to digitally accept and acknowledge those documents. Oh, that's awesome. And yeah. Our caregivers, they want to read them because it's their license on the line too. If they take a minute, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's their license, their livelihood that can do that. And then the cool thing is too, is it's actually arguably more handy because those documents then stay in their app. So if I'm a care yeah. hero working in a building and something happens, I open my phone 
with two, you know, taps of my finger, I find all of those policies and I can get what I need where your own full-time staff probably doesn't know what office to go in and what binder to open up. Or they got 55 pages with the documents. They don't know which page is on. So we didn't, I didn't know that Bridget. So that's awesome. So we can promote okay. that for you um, because you are training the people to the facility um, because before you're yeah, signing a we, contract with the facility. We have very specifically use the word orientation. Okay, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so excited about that. I saw the CARES um, presentation at the convention, and that was not mentioned at that point in time. So that's awesome. You guys have come miles ahead of that. <laughs> Good. So Bridget, then, okay, so what I understood you to say is that each facility, when they set up their um, portal or their, what's the page that you called it? Their user? Their profile. Their profile. Then each facility you're saying can upload their their uh, their orientation documents. So each yes. facility that they choose to work with, they have to digitally acknowledge and you have proof that they've said, yes, I have read this. Yep. And you have the state regs in there as well. That's what you're saying? So the state regs aren't necessarily in there. The state regs just drive how we program our technology to perform. Mm -hmm. So the state reg tells us what Colorado has in their orientation requirements. So then those are the system, those are the documents that our system requires a Colorado community to upload before they can post ship. Ah, okay. Same on the hero side. The state regs tell us what is required for a hero. Is it a simple TB test or is it a full medical exam? Some states are different. Is it just a background check or is it background check and fingerprint? So we, the state regs get programmed mm -hmm. in and then we say, if you're a hero in Florida, you need these things and our system walks them through that. Oh, that's awesome to hear. That's more sophisticated than I thought you were. So we're excited about that. Yeah. That's great, amazing. Great. So let me show you actually, I want to, do we have time? Well, actually, yep. never mind. Keep going. Yep. Well, because I, I would have to log into this Zoom on my phone and I don't know how handy that link is. So never but I was going to show you an actual Denver building where they have, um, and you probably won't be able to see it now because it's blurred out. Um, if you look, so this is like, this is dumb. I'm sorry. It's not going to work. <laughs> Video settings. Let me turn off my blur background and see if that does anything. Um, okay. So now you guys can see sort of the app, maybe mm -hmm. not really. Oh yeah, but yeah. This, yeah. Okay, so this is a shift that posted for a QMAP in Denver. This little button right here, this document, this is where the hero goes to see what's required and they click on one. And this is essentially, so this is the actual building in Denver. It's their policies on pagers, so I can see that document yeah. here as well. But oh, at the very yeah. minimum, we require emergency and evacuation procedures. Um, here's their emergency manual. Mm -hmm. You can see that the hero reads that right on the app. Oh, that's that's brilliant. That's awesome. So when I call you and I or I put it through the app that I need somebody, I can see that they're trained. Um, and if I've already used a lot of your care staff, I can. Can I pick specific care staff or I just put it out there and put the price? You put it out there and you put the price initially. Once okay. you have a relationship with somebody, their profile now also lives in your login. Okay. So you have like you have a menu on the side that has all of the heroes. Those uh -huh. are heroes that have worked in your building. Oh, so that's now awesome. Yeah. You've worked with Jan for five or six shifts and you really liked her and you need her, you could go right to her profile, message her, call her and say, hey, Jan, I'm going to post a shift. I really need help on Friday. Can uh oh, <laughs> see, you guys one up Uber because you can't request a driver. With Uber. <laughs> right? You just one up to them. <laughs> thing we want, we know the importance of continuity of staff. We want our yeah. heroes to be yeah. aligned with the communities, not with care. Oh, we yeah. want them to understand yeah. care is a great place for them to get connected to community, but we don't want to be the middleman. Yeah, yeah. You connect oh. people that work for you. 
I am so excited for you guys. I, I just think this is such an opportunity for all states. I mean, Denver is just dying out here for labor. So I'm so excited for you guys. And, and this clarifies a lot of questions. Calla gets some questions about staffing. So we could definitely um, maybe do a training session with our Cala members sometime. That would be awesome be because, yeah, I, some of this did not get addressed at our conference. Yeah. Yeah, and we we have our VP of product. She manages all of our uh, compliance as well. She's mm -hmm. a thousand more brilliant than I am. So if yeah. we have that call, I'll invite her to that call as well because she'll bring all the good information. Oh my gosh! Well, we are so excited. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well you got Janet excited. I think that's a big thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> she knows. <laughs> well, now I'm, I'm on the Cala website and we represent a lot of the assisted living. So we can put some of those fears to rest. I'm also on the ALAC committee, which is the assisted living advisory committee for the state health department. And uh, so we can go back to them to tell them, no, this is compliant. Yeah. So we're excited. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and honestly, and I don't, I don't want to take up too much time with one-on-one -on -one with Janet, but if there is anything, we, we love our partners. We are doing this. We're kind of, you know, building this too. So if there is something you find that is not compliant or whatever, we, you know, we always adapt very quickly. We get our engineers to whatever we can learn. So it's, it's always a back and forth to help us understand what holes we might have. So far, we feel pretty confident that we've you know, addressed it all, but also regulations change. So there's um, been, I mean, we've been in Denver since late 2019, two and a half calendar years, and probably half a dozen regulations in Colorado have already changed. So our partners help keep us informed with that stuff as well. Good. Thank you. Bridget, Jan had a question. She said, is this just in Denver area or other communities in Colorado? Yeah, so we're heavy in Colorado. We're also in Colorado Springs, um, up into Boulder. We are just starting to look into Fort Collins as well. Um, that's most of the, the Colorado area that we're in now. Um, that being said, once we hear strong demand, kind of like I said earlier, the supply and the demand, once we hear a lot of demand, we can ramp up our recruiting efforts for a certain market. Once we get enough heroes, then we can certainly expand into additional markets. And Scott asked, are you guys set up in the New Orleans market, the Nolens market? That one is super exciting. We just started recruiting in Louisiana. Um, so we are um, hopefully going to be able to offer to uh, communities to post shift. Recruiting typically takes us, we like to say about 60 days. Um, it depends on the nuances of things like background checks, how long they take, if they require fingerprints. But so far, Louisiana looks to be a pretty easy path for our heroes. Um, so New Orleans is next and very exciting. Awesome. Uh, I did post, if you saw, it's uh, a whole bunch of links. And I put a link to your website, Bridget. Did you want me to put your email address in there as well? Yeah, absolutely. I'm okay. available. For do you want to do you want to type that into the chat and just kind of post yeah. that? Anybody who's still yeah. on, if you haven't posted your information and you would like to share that, go ahead and type it into the chat. And then I'll walk you guys through how to save that chat so that you can access that later. Give just a second here. So if you're looking at the chat screen, there's three little dots on the right depending on what you're looking at, but on my screen, there's a button that says save chat. And that is all you have to do, click that. And then it'll download to wherever you have set to download your chats and recordings and stuff. So I have a Zoom folder and it just pops right into there. So um, I did wanna remind you guys all, if you don't have any more questions, uh, we are gonna have a newsletter coming out. Um, it's kind of more focused. Uh, Janet, if you have anything you want to add to the newsletter, like I said, some links, some upcoming events, I would love to feature that. Peter, you know, if you have anything coming up, uh, I think you're speaking somewhere. I wanted to put that in there. So um, please do send me that information. Hi, Al. <laughs> all right. Does anybody have, oh, Jan, did we answer all your questions? I thought I saw you pop up a couple times. Jan Gardner. 
Yes, I'm good, thank you. Okay, perfect. Anybody else before we shut it down? All right, well, Vern always leaves the, the chat open. I'm gonna stop the recording. I can figure that out here. And